You may be seated. Church, it's with great privilege that we can take up our Bibles in this moment and invite you to turn <clears throat> to Romans chapter 12. We should never take for granted that we hold God's Word in our hands, that the living Spirit of God works through the Word of God to shape and transform the lives of believers who give themselves to it in faith. So let's pause for a moment just ask the Lord to give us a heart of faith and trust and obedience and submission to His Word. Father, thank You this morning. Thank You for not only sending Christ who is enough. Him alone is enough. But then giving us a book with written words, with guidance and clarity. And then giving us one another, calling us into a family. What a privilege it is, Father, for us to be a part of the body of Christ together here at Trinity. God, I'm so humbled and thankful for the ways that You are working in the lives of people here, how that's shaping me and how I get to be a part of other people's journey as well. Lord, we pray in these moments that as we come to Your Word, we remember that we, we're not just coming individually to You, but we're coming together as a family. And Holy Spirit, now take Your, take your Word and make it living and active and effective in our hearts and minds. So we leave here not only hearing, but doing and experiencing Your transforming work in our lives as we walk by faith. Lord, I need Your help this morning. Fill me. Make me Your servant to Your people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, today in our series of the One Another's of Scripture, we are turning our attention to honoring one another. And I've been particularly excited about this one this week because this has been an important theme, especially in our family as we've been raising our kids. Uh, thinking and talking about honor has been uh, an important theme. And so I'm excited for us to discuss this today. If we're going to follow Christ in friendship with one another, it will mean esteeming one another with honor. As you all know, friendship is not just about extracting something from someone else, correct? I, mean, I hope we all know that, right? It's not just about getting companionship or getting security or respect or help. All those things come out of friendship, but actually... Friendship is about mutually building one another up for the other's good. 1 Corinthians 10.24 says, Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. And when two people honor each other this way, it will result in a healthy friendship. So let me begin this morning by simply defining the word honor. And then we'll look at the call to honor one another in the New Testament. So what does it mean to honor? Well, we all probably know, but I'm going to give you a definition anyway. It means to esteem others highly. And in a biblical context, we'd say to esteem one another highly, more highly than yourself. By the way, if you are an individual who has a, a tendency to kind of... Um, have a low esteem of others, kind of view people with a lower esteem, that is an indication of pride at work, right? So it's the, it's the exact opposite of honor. Honor also means to express uh, respect or high esteem with words or actions, to revere, to exalt, to show deference, that is to defer to one another and to even show submission in certain contexts. So the basic sense of honor is putting others ahead of yourself. That's the basic idea. And as you can see, this idea of honor, this term, has a wide range of meaning, meanings. And yet the, the heart of honor requires an others-centered perspective rather than a self-centered perspective. So honor is not necessarily natural or easy, is it? Right? This goes against the vein of who we are as sinners. 
To be a man of honor or a woman of honor is to be noble-minded, to have dignified respect for character. A man of honor is a man of inner worth, not just outward esteem. Okay? So we're getting at the heart of things here. Now, where do we find the call to honor one another in Scripture? Well, let's go to Romans 12, 10 this morning. And I'm going to read it to you from a couple of different translations today. First, the ESV. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's ESV. Or the NAS. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Now, it's interesting here, isn't it, that in a single verse there are two one another's back to back. You see that? Love one another with brotherly affection, then honor one another, right? Well, we're going to come back to the first one in a few weeks later, in, a little bit later in our series. We're going to come back to being devoted to one another in brotherly love. Today we're going to focus on the second one, which has to do with honoring one another. But I want you to notice this morning the close association between loving and honoring one another in verse 10. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been um, looking at loving one another as the umbrella or the summary of all the other one another's other all the other one another's in Scripture. That's a tongue twister. Uh, and the reason I chose to move to honor next after loving one another is because loving someone from a, from the heart is inseparable from honoring them. Okay. We kind of sometimes take for granted that we love each other because, you know, we're in close relationships with each other, maybe in a family or in in the body of Christ, and and we can kind of take that for granted. But love always conducts itself with honor. Loving people lovingly is to honor them. Now, let's take a closer look at verse 10. The differing translations between the ESV and the NAS indicate that there's uh, some difficulty here in bringing uh, the particular Greek phrase into English. That's why we have uh, some kind of varying translations here. Neither are bad translations. They're both good translations. They just have different nuances as they're trying to sit it into English for us. Here's why. The Greek verb here has the, the, the basic sense of to go before. To go before. Does that look like what we see in those verses? You can see now why it's hard to bring that into English, right? But in this context, to go before does not mean for the sake of putting oneself first, but actually for the sake of putting others first. And so we're trying to figure out how to say this in English. I think the best sense here is to lead the way in showing honor to others. Go before, lead the way in showing honor to others. Now, let's consider just the unique nuances of both translations this morning. The New American Standard says, give preference to one another in honor. The sense here is to put the other person ahead of yourself. You give them preference. You prefer them. Consider the needs and interests of the other person above your own in importance. In other words, I have important needs right now, but what's more important to me is meeting the needs that you have right now. Okay? That's the idea. This requires a humble disposition, does it not? Earlier in verse 3, it's interesting throughout Romans uh, 12, actually, you know, Doug read from the call to worship this morning, we're to present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, right? Right? We begin with a wholehearted love for God. That's where Romans 12 begins, that wholehearted love for God we've been looking at over the last few weeks. And then Paul says in verse 3, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And now he's putting humility in its place for us. That's the next thing. God-centered, humble. And then he proceeds to talk about giving honor to one another. So honor is an attitude that willingly humbles oneself to give preference to the other person. Giving preference to others means giving special weight or value 
to the other person, humbly considering their needs as more important than our own. By the way, (laughs) preferring others includes viewing our preferences as only preferences, right? So it's okay to forego my preferences to serve you. That's okay. That's actually a God-honoring thing that I can do from time to time in my life. Now, let's go to the ESV. Beautifully here, intensifying the command. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. Sounds like a competition, doesn't it? (laughs) There is almost a sense of competitiveness here. In other words, don't settle for just being honored by someone else. Return honor all the more. Return honor all the more. By the way, this this is the only competition that should exist in our relationships. Period. It's it's okay to have competition in games and that kind of stuff, but in our relationships, this is the only competition the Bible calls for. No jealousy, no envy, no selfishness, just competitive honor. And... I don't, know if even, I don't know if even competition is the right word to use here, but the point is, if you both focus on honoring the other, you're going to be in a healthy place. And notice the call that here is not just to honor other people. The call is to honor one another mutually. It's mutual honor. What happens when two people seek to outdo each other in showing honor to the other? What happens when two people prefer one another ahead of themselves or esteem the other more highly or put the needs of the other ahead of their own? What happens in that relationship? I'll tell you what happens. Self-centeredness dies. And, even more beautifully, both people's needs are being met. This is a beautiful way to do family. It's a beautiful way to do friendship And it's the only way to do marriage well. The only way. When two people are taking on the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, 3 through 5, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard the other as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of the other. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. When two people do that in a marriage, that marriage will not be perfect, but it will thrive. It will be healthy. It will be filled with humility and grace. And needs will be met. And there will be selflessness rather than self-centeredness. This is why, by the way, when I take any couple through premarital counseling, we spend a lot of time in Philippians 2. It's the core passage that we work from. So start memorizing that, you guys. All right. So how do we put on honor? How do we do it? I'm going I'm to offer four principles as suggestions this morning. Number one, honor begins by cultivating personal humility. You can't begin any other place. You can't possibly honor in any other way if you don't begin by cultivating personal humility. Now, it's obvious that to honor someone, to consider them above you, so to speak, means humbling yourself to be in a supportive, serving, or encouraging role. We honor from a position of humility. Now, if you're humble, it will not be hard for you to honor other people or to put others first. And yet as we survey the book of Proverbs, what's interesting is that humility is both the posture from which we give honor and it's the disposition upon which God Himself bestows honor. Are you with me this morning? So humility is the correct posture for both giving and receiving honor. You know, you will never go wrong by cultivating humility in your life. (laughs) You will never be shorted for choosing a humble road in your life. God honors the humble. 
All right, let's take a look at Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will what? Obtain honor. So here, humility is not only the place from which we're giving honor, it's the place in which we obtain honor. Proverbs 22, 4 teaches us that God rewards humility and the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 18, 12. Humility goes before honor. That is, humility precedes honor. Or to say it in, in a similar way, in Proverbs 15, 33, before honor comes humility. You see how one of the reasons I, I say all these verses from Proverbs, even though they basically say the same thing, is because I want you to see, you know, when there's redundancy in the Bible, it's there on purpose. The writer of Proverbs really wants us to take this to heart. This is a father writing to his son saying, don't miss this. This is so important for your life. Honor begins with cultivating personal humility. Secondly, honor is grounded in the intrinsic worth of being image bearers of God. Honor is about, whether you're giving or receiving, doesn't matter, honor is about being a, an, an image bearer of God. In Genesis 1, God created mankind in His own image, and then we're told He blessed them. What is blessing? It's a form of honor, actually. Is it not? When you bless somebody, are you not honoring them? God blessed them. And then he said that it was very good. In a sense, God's blessing and this pronouncement of, of affirmation, what is God affirming here? He's affirming the goodness of his own image in those whom he's created. Now that's good, he says. That looks a little bit like me. That's good. And that's okay for God to say because he's perfect. Right? And so, God in a sense here is honoring His own image in us and therefore it would be dishonorable for us to not also honor His image in one another or in ourselves for that matter. Now we often honor people for accomplishments or some expression of noble character, but what I want you to see here is that expressing honor to someone does not need to be limited by the other person's performance. There is a degree of intrinsic worth in every person worthy of basic honor and respect because they are simply image bearers of God. Image bearers of God. So, honor recognizes the intrinsic worth of others as image bearers of God and regards them with the dignity and the respect and the grace that God Himself bestows on His children. On his image bearers. So in other words, I don't, I don't want to relate any in a way that's, that's less honorable toward others than God himself does. That would be dishonoring to God. This is where a Jesus-shaped vision of relating to people enters in. Remember we've been talking about a Jesus-shaped vision of relating to people? Here's, here it is. It's been said... Christ transforms how we see other people and it opens our eyes to who they really are. Image bearers of God worthy of dignity and honor. In the words of C.S. Lewis, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Let's do something awkward. Look around right now. Just look around. Look around. Not a single mere mortal in this room. Reflecting on Lewis's statement, Barnabas Piper writes the following, and I'm going to extend, I'm going to quote a bit extensively here, a kind of a paragraph from his book, Belong. This is worth listening to. Here's what he says. We only recognize our God-given worth when Christ has lifted our eyes from our natural, temporal, navel-gazing perspective to His magnificent, eternal perspective. Every person you encounter is an, is an eternal image-bearer of God, imbued with profound dignity and worth. Every believer 
you meet is a beloved child. Most of us do not recognize that about ourselves or others. We see others as defined either by our worst moments or by what we deem to be our greatest accomplishments, in which case a bad moment can bring us crashing down. We do not naturally see one another as defined by our Creator. This only happens when Jesus opens our eyes. Until this happens, we cannot feel safe around others. We cannot feel uh, be fully honest. We cannot offer safety to others. If we were to reveal what is deep inside us, it might be exploited, used, turned against us, or neglected. However, Once Jesus gets a hold of us and we see ourselves and others as beloved and dignified and of more worth than we can imagine, we treat them as they deserve. We protect and uphold one another's dignity so there is no room for shaming or gossip or harsh criticism and we outdo one another in showing honor. By intentionally, publicly, verbally highlighting and celebrating how we see God's fingerprints on the lives of those around us and by reminding people of who they are in Christ. End of quote. So, understanding our God-given worth as, as our security, that, that's how you can be secure as a person, you are, you are created in the image of God. You are loved by God, redeemed by God, kept by God. And out of that security, you are enabled to humble yourself and to grant honor to other image bearers of God. So, what have we seen so far? Honor begins by cultivating personal humility. And honor is grounded in the fact that we are image bearers of God, both both ourselves and the people we seek to honor. Third, the giving of honor proceeds from honorable character. This is simply a reminder that we can act honorably toward anyone. Church, we can act honorably toward anyone regardless of their honor or their lack of honor. How? By putting godly character into action. This is why I have a sticky note in the front of my Bible that says, give honor out of an honorable life. In other words, Ty, just reminding yourself, it's on you. You can give honor because Christ is in you, and if you have godly character, you're free to live an honorable life toward everybody around you. Do I do it perfectly? No, I don't. That's why I need to be reminded. Praise God for sticky notes, right? (laughs) Number four, honor is granted or expressed in multiple ways. Okay? While honor itself is a verb, honor one another, right? It's also an attitude, is it not? It's a mindset. It's a a disposition of mind, right? Um, Though we, we, we can say and do things to elevate someone, it's, a, it's an attitude expressed in many of the other one another's, <laughs> such as serving one another, caring for one another, encouraging one, one another. When we, when we care for somebody or encourage somebody or we serve somebody, that's a way of honoring them. So I think it's helpful to think of honor <clears throat> excuse me, as a part of a, a bigger package, okay? Honor is preceded by humility, can't be separated. And honor produces something else. It produces all kinds of of things like serving, encouraging, those kinds of things. So let's look at it this way. You can throw that up on the screen. The virtue we're talking about here this morning behind honor is humility. That's the character quality. Humility is essential. It's the seed that will sprout and grow into an honorable life. The attitude or the disposition of the heart is honor. That's like the the stem or the stalk of the plant, (laughs) right? But what's the fruit? That's the action. That's the things we do out of an honorable life, out of an honorable spirit, like serving or encouraging or those kinds of things. So there are endless ways that we can express honor toward others. Let me just offer a few suggestions this morning. 
be conscious, be conscientious of other people's needs or preferences and actively seek to feel fill, to fulfill them. <laughs> That's the word. Right? So it, it is, sometimes it just starts with awareness. Being aware uh, that a person has needs in their life and just thinking about how can I help fulfill those or, or who do I know that I can connect them with to help them with this particular issue in their life. Or express appreciation or sincere gratitude when you see others serving or receive the benefit of their ministry. Right? Gratitude is a, is a tremendous way to honor somebody. Appreciation. Um, that's related to an, another thing, which is reviving the lost art of affirmation. True affirmation, like verbalizing, celebrating the evidence of Christ-like character in someone. When you see somebody living in a way that's noble and honorable, sacrificial, when you see them loving well, serving well, sacrificing well, when you see them willing to take the back seat and function in the shadows, those are things to affirm in people's lives. You want to affirm and encourage godly character that's being shaped in them. It's a great way to honor people. Or simply serving people. We honor people by serving, right? We already talked about that. Or what about speaking well of others in public or private settings? Man, this is a really great way to produce a healthy atmosphere in the body of Christ, in the church setting, right? When, when you're talking with somebody else, and someone else comes to the topic, and just to, just to speak well of them and to, to honor them in that conversation, even though that person's not there to hear it, that's a great way to build the right atmosphere in the body of Christ. Or what about refusing to dwell on negative thoughts of another person, but rather seeking to think the best of them? We have choices to make in the thoughts that we dwell on when it comes to other people. And honorable thinking, honorable hearts will say, I'm not going to dwell on that. That is a flaw or that's something that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But you know what? That's not the whole of this person. And we turn our thoughts and begin to think about and dwell on the evidences of grace in that person and the ways we've seen God work beautifully in their life. That's honorable. Philippians 4 tells us to set our minds on that which is honorable, right? Or simply giving gifts, or encouragement, or prayer. Prayer is one way that we honor each other as we pray for one another. So, where do we look for, our, for the ultimate example of honor? All right? Well, Jesus, of course, was the most honorable person to ever walk the face of this earth. Was he not? In fact, we could define an honorable life with the words of Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. I wish I had a we should have had a dollar for every time I've quoted that passage from this pulpit and the pulpits that preceded it. <laughs> Why so core to our Christian life? That is the heart and mind and life of Jesus that we're called to emulate. It's an honorable life. Putting the needs of others ahead of yourself. And Jesus not only lived this way every day of his life, but he bestowed honor on us in the ultimate sense. Putting our need for forgiveness ahead of his own life. And he went to the cross to meet that need. So don't overlook that humility that was required, for, uh, the, the humility that was required for Jesus to honor us with sacrificial love. Philippians 2 goes on to say, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made, made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on a cross. Notice that every phrase, every phrase, every phrase is a phrase of humbling Himself. He was equal with God. He didn't cling to that privilege. He became a man. It was even more humbling to be found in appearance as a man. He humbled Himself in obedience. He humbled Himself to go to the cross. Do you see now how humility and honor are at the heart of the Gospel? There's no Gospel. There's no good news. There's no salvation if Jesus did not humble Himself greatly. He not only humbled Himself, He honored us by putting our needs ahead of His own. So humility and honor at the heart of the Gospel. And then Jesus, through His death, called us into friendship with Him whereby we would honor Him who had honored us so there would be mutual honor not only between us and Christ, but mutual honor among His brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. What I want you to see here is that honor is not extracurricular. It is not optional in the Christian life as though it's a mere bonus. Oh yeah, I live a, 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 an obedient life. I live a moral life. And you know what? To, to add a little more, I'm going to do some honorable things. No, no, that's not how it works. Honor is at the core. It's at the heart. Honoring one another for the sake of honoring God is how we live Christ-following lives. By the way, Jesus humbled Himself and honored us out of a wholehearted love for God, did He not? That was the one singular motivation. It was always His motivation in everything. Now remember earlier, we discovered in Proverbs that humility is the posture from which we both give and receive honor. So it's not surprising that the next thing we read in Philippians 2 is that is God's response of honoring Jesus for His unspeakable humility. Therefore, God highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. God the Father giving Jesus the ultimate honor for His ultimate humility. It's essential for us to see that honor is at the heart of the Gospel and mutual honor is at the heart of Jesus' relationship with the Father. This is what we're called to emulate. To be like God. This is how we do it. Jesus honored the Father by always giving preference to the Father's will. We've seen this over and over in the Gospels. My food is to do the will of my Father. I don't say or speak or do anything that I don't say or hear from the Father or see the Father doing or receive from the Father, right? And the Father, in return, honored Jesus not only by exalting Him after the resurrection, but also with those great words of affirmation, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Right? So, I think I've made a case this morning that if the Gospel is going to reign among us, if we're going to be like Christ, it calls us to a life of mutual honor, but what happens when we fail to honor one another? What happens? Here's what happens. We destroy the aroma of Christ in the church and in our friendships. You know, you could put together a list of all the right things a church should have to be a good church. You know, God-centered preaching, preaching the Bible, Christ-exalting worship, a praying church, good small groups and discipleship ministries. You can go down the list and make your perfect list. But if the aroma of Christ is not in that church, 
there's going to be a big hole. Right? And the aroma of Christ, you know where the aroma of Christ shows up? It shows up in our relationships with one another. Mutual love and care and honor and forgiveness and serving and bearing one another's burdens. Being the body of Christ. Christ in us. So when we, when we fail to honor one another, we destroy gospel culture. We destroy gospel living. In 1 Corinthians 11, we find a very vivid example uh, of this. And so in the, in the interest of time this morning, I'm just going to summarize for us what's in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says to the Corinthians that when you come together as a church, it is not for the better, but for the worse. I don't know about you, but that's not a church I want to be a part of. Right? When you come together, it's, it's for the worse. Why? There are divisions among you. And when you gather for the Lord's Supper, it is not the Lord's Supper. That is, it is not communion with God, nor with each other, because their selfishness had quenched the Spirit of God. Instead of, here's what's happening, instead of waiting for one another, you know, in those days, the Lord's Supper was more of a, of a meal, a love feast, they called it, right, than, than what we have today. But instead of waiting for one another to gather, some would come early and indulge themselves, while others came late and got nothing. <laughs> so Paul reminds them of the meaning of the Lord's Supper with Jesus' words, this is my body which is for you. In other words, Remember His sacrifice. Putting your needs ahead of His own life. That's the meaning. Then Paul calls them to examine themselves because those who fail to discern the truth and dishonor the body of Christ eat and drink judgment upon themselves in taking the Lord's Supper. That's very clear in 1 Corinthians 11. And so he says, if you're hungry... Eat at home first so that the love feast is not tainted by selfish craving and dishonor toward one another. And finally then, Paul issues yet another one another in verse 33. He says, wait for one another. Wait for one another. Now I've included this here because they're not just to simply wait, but in their waiting they are to honor one another as fellow brothers and sisters, image bearers in the body of Christ. What's 1 Corinthians 11 about? It's about restoring the aroma of Christ. It's about restoring gospel culture. It's about restoring the intent and the purpose of what it means to be in Christ together. So Paul is calling them, without using the word honor specifically, <laughs> He's calling them to honor one another. So the point that I want to drive home from 1 Corinthians 11 is that apart from mutually honoring one another in the body of Christ, we cannot be a gospel-tasting, gospel-smelling, gospel-thriving body together. But... When we give preference to one another in honor, and when we even outdo one another in giving honor in a thousand different ways, the aroma of Christ becomes so intense in our homes and in our church family that our children and our neighbors begin to grow hungry for Jesus. They'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another, and love always acts with honor. So, what can we do this week to, to take our honor thermostat and just turn it up one degree? Can we do that? One degree can make quite a bit of difference. Let's, let me just give you several suggestions. I'm asking you just do one thing this week, right? Let's not be hearers of the word. We've heard now. What are we going to do? So let me just give you some suggestions and you can take it from there. Number one, write it on your heart. Uh, during the last song today, in a few minutes, during the last song, the ushers are going to come and pass out a card. It's got Philippians 2, 3 through 5 on one side. It's got Romans 12, 10 on the back. Uh, and anybody who's old enough to read can take a card, okay? 
And uh, there'll be extras probably in the back on the counter, and, and you can take more if you want. If you want one for your bathroom mirror, one for your rear view mirror, <laughs> one for your... Anyway, um, take, use it. Memorize it. Memorize it. Write it on your heart. You'll be much more likely to apply it in your marriage, your family life, your friendships, if you make it your mindset by writing it on your heart. Or, here's another idea. Consider just one person you could honor this week. Is there one person this week you could honor with encouragement or affirmation, maybe serving a need they have, or just doing something to lighten their load? And by the way, you could even do it anonymously if you want. You're still honoring them, right? Or how about praying for a heart to honor your spouse and then looking for ways uh, to, to answer that prayer? Or children, <laughs> pray for a heart to honor your parents this week. I'm really serious when I talk about honor has, a, has its first place in our homes, right? Uh, one thing that was really helpful, helpful for us when, we were, when our kids were young is uh, we listened to and read some books by Scott Taransky and Joanne Miller. They're, they have the, uh, what they call the National Center for Biblical Parenting. And their whole thing was honor-based parenting, right? Honor-based parenting. Trying to help your kids develop honorable character, right? And one of the simple little things we took away from them, which was really, which was really great, was something called an honor check. So our kids had chores every week that they had to do. And um, in doing their chores, we would say, now, like, Maybe your, your chore this week is to clean the, the bathroom, the purple bathroom, and, and your job is to do, you know, whatever, wash dishes, whatever it is. And then when you get done with your chore, I want you to do an honor check. And what that means is look around and see something that, that could be done to be helpful to the whole family you've not been asked to do. Do one thing extra. Um, and it was a great way to teach them to not just do what's required, to look for ways to honor and to serve and bless other people around them. And it was fun for them to find something to do. What was really fun was when they went off to babysit. And once the kids got to bed and the kids were sleeping at night, they'd do some honor checking. And maybe the dishes would get washed or a floor would get vacuumed. Um, It was a great way to just build godly character to them and to bless others. Or, one last reminder here, maybe focus your conversations more on the other person this week than on yourself. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to talk about yourself. You need to be open and vulnerable if you're going to have a relationship and share your life. Some of us do that better than others. We need to share our life. But it'd be really great exercise for a week to say, I'm going to talk as little about myself this week as I can. And I'm going to use that time to really invest my interest in the other person that I'm talking to. That's a way to honor them. All right, finally, remember that honoring one another begins with honoring God. So church, let's outdo one another. Let's outdo one another in showing honor with a wholehearted love for God. Father, we're so thankful this morning. We are amazed. Who are we that the Lord of all the earth should care to know our name? And then to honor us in the ultimate way of laying down his life for us. Lord, may the truth and the reality of what you've done for us truly humble us. And may it give us a desire to be like you, to truly honor others out of a humble heart and in so doing to honor you. So Father, show us tangible ways this week to really implement honor into our marriages, into our parenting, into our relationships in the home, into our families, into our workplace. Give us a vision, Lord, to to live an honorable life, to have honorable character, and in so doing, to point people to the one who has ultimate honor, who's ultimately worthy of our admiration and our praise and our joy and our trust. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.